So it's a real privilege tonight to have Herodotus come and preach. And uh, <clears throat> I want to say I, it's, it's awesome that you're so excited that he's going to be here. Because th- I think it says something uh, to us that we're a family. It says something about what we love and what we value. We love to encourage. We love to see people succeed. We love to see you fulfill the plan and the purpose that God has upon your life. And there are some amazing young men who have preached. And I know the ladies, the girls in the office gave me a stick this week. And I know there's some amazing lady preachers amongst us too. And I'm just grateful for the team that's around. I think of Zane and Praise and even old Michael Lake here in the front, just kind of getting him to do more and more and getting him involved in some things and just the amazing young ladies that are around to serve. And our worship teams, we appreciate you. And it's a privilege to have young people like Vix. Well, you're not that young anymore, hey, Vix? And Sarah leading, <laughs> leading worship and being involved. And it's a privilege. It's a privileged family to do church with young, passionate people. And you young, passionate people, you count it a privilege to do life with us older, wiser, faithful people. Hey, but we're a family from generation to generation. But I want to say this. Herodotus is just such a wonderful lover of Jesus. He's an amazing young man. And God has been speaking to me a couple of years ago. I felt like the Lord say, invite him on to staff and let him do some things. And I went and asked him and he was keen. And, uh, and I think I saw in him what he didn't see right there and then. But I had a sense that God was calling him to ministry, that God was wanting to shape his life uh, for the purpose of teaching God's people. And slowly but surely, he's been seeing that more and more and more. And, uh, and we just love and appreciate you and appreciate who you are and what you carry the kind, compassionate, gentle lover of Jesus that you are. And it's a privilege to have you preach tonight, G. We celebrate you, we love you, and we honor you, and we're grateful that God is working with you and in you and through you, and we celebrate you tonight. Amen? Cool. Why don't you come? Come on, let's put our hands together. Let's honor a young man. You know, so uh, uh, I've been telling Herodotus the whole week, you know, because he asked, you know, should, should I tell you what I'm preaching? I'm like, no, just don't mess it up. <laughs> but we love you. You go for it. Enjoy. All right. Hey, how's it going, everybody? <laughs> cool. Uh, it's a real privilege to be here tonight, um, to speak to all of you, to have your attention and your hearts for the next half an hour. Um, I put together a video this week um, that's just got, it's got some context for the message, and so just pay attention to the screens as uh, they play that video for us. Cool. I have done all you have asked. I have prayed three hours a day for the past month. I've read half the Bible and memorized the book of Galatians. I have served extensively at my local church and I have given to the poor and helped those in need. I work hard to provide for those I love. I have led two people to salvation this week. I hope you are pleased with my actions. Is that it? Um, it, yeah, that's it. I, I thought it'd be fine, but uh, I could do better. Ridiculous. You honestly think you've done enough? <sighs> Just half the Bible. Really? The book of Galatians? You think this is a joke? You think God's going to be happy with that? Come on, man. Put in the effort. So much wasted potential. Get over your laziness and get more stuff done. I'm I'm trying. I'm sorry. Trying isn't good enough. Just attempting isn't going to save anyone. (sighs) This unfortunately isn't going to work for us. We need a little bit more commitment, you know, a little bit more sacrifice. (sighs) How how much spare time do you have? I I, I barely have time for myself. So you're thinking about yourself? You're not even part of the equation. Uh, 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 Haven't I done enough? Have you saved everyone? Is the world fixed? Are you fixed? 
No. Then you haven't done enough. You're useless, worthless. Why can't you be any stronger? What have you been doing all this time? You haven't even stopped your sin. You haven't gotten smarter or better. How many more people are going to perish that you aren't saving? You need to work more hours. You need to earn more money. Otherwise, realistically, you're going to fail your family. What about all that stuff you've been procrastinating? Stop. Please stop. Get your emotions in check. What are you begging for? How much longer are you going to waste away doing nothing? <laughs> Listen to the voices. I've got some friends of mine I'd like you to meet. They like you, my sons and daughters. They can help you. And I think you'll be surprised how you'll be able to help them. Thank you to everybody that helped me make that. Praise and <laughs> Cherise and my dad and everybody. Um, yeah, so that was a bit of a snapshot of my own dialogue to myself. You know? Just, are you doing enough? Am I doing enough? You know? And uh, I felt to share that because I don't think I'm the only one that thinks that sometimes. And the reality is that that's not what God's up to, what he's thinking about us. It's not his dialogue. Um, and I think we sometimes make, we, like, we do I idolatry, you know, we make God something that he's not in, in how we talk to ourselves, you know. Like, you know, we think that God says all these things about us. We're convinced that that's how he thinks about us. But we're actually creating a God that doesn't exist. Because he doesn't see us that way at all. He doesn't talk to us that way at all. Um, and so tonight's message is really about how does he respond to our brokenness? How does he respond to what we don't like about ourselves or what we don't like about each other? Um, yeah, cool. And I'm going to start with a question. So I'll put it up on the screen. I hope this, this thing works. <laughs> Otherwise, I'll ask the team to help me. Uh, is anything coming on there? All right. Anything working there? No? Okay. The slides are on. Oh, there we go. Yay. Cool. So the first question is, what are you, what am I paying attention to? Uh, in that video, the character was paying attention to all of the questions that he was asking himself, all of the things that he wasn't doing enough. He's paying attention to the self-judgment. Um, whereas God was saying something else and he wasn't paying attention to that. And the reality is that we only have 24 hours every day. We have limited attention, we have limited capacity for focus. And what we focus on is what determines how we think, determines how we act, and it determines our lives, our identity, the context for everything. Um, so the question is, as well, what voices am I listening to? Am I listening to God's voices, His voice? Or am I listening to the judgment of myself? Am I listening to the enemy's voice? Am I listening to the people that look down on me or judge me? Who, who, what voices 
am I paying attention to? Because again, the reality is God's not thinking that. He's not thinking that I'm not enough. He does notice my faults, and we'll get to that. He does realize there's brokenness in my life, but he responds in a very, very different way than we think he does. So the first time sin ever happened, in Genesis 3, um, God responds a certain way to the sin of man. So he asks them three questions. So again, this is the first time that anyone's ever sinned in ever. And this is how he responds. He asks them three questions. He asks, where are you? Who told you that you were naked? And have you eaten from the tree that I commanded you not to eat from? And what is this you have done? He asks these, these questions. And just to give some context for the story, so God made Eden, he built, um, he built the whole world, and he puts them in this garden, and everything is just awesome. He's like, you guys can eat from everything, everything. It's so cool. Just not this one tree. Just don't touch this tree, but everything else you can have, you know? And so they're having this awesome time with God, and they're having this connection. And then <coughs> there's a point where Eve is having time with the garden, just, you know, enjoying it. And then the enemy's like, hmm, that's a pretty good tree over there, you know? <laughs> You should try that one. And she's like, oh, yeah, you know, you said we shouldn't or whatever. And he's like, oh, but is it really that bad? I mean, look at it, how it looks. Look at just smell it. Just, you know, like, oh, you know. And she gives her attention to this tree. She focuses on it. She's oh, like, oh, this is so sweet and so good and all that. And eventually she takes it and she eats it. And immediately something happens. She responds to that and she's shameful. She's scared. She hides. And after Adam eats it as well with them, both of them are hiding. And so then they're hiding from each other. They're covering up their nakedness. They were once free and they were once um, open to each other, but now they've, they've put this barrier between each other. And then God's walking in the garden. Um, and I think the, the way that the verse speaks, it's, it's almost like he's just been doing that this whole time. Like he's just walking in the cool of the day. He's just in the garden and he walks to them and he sees what's happened and then he asks them where are you and that speaks to me and again I'm just going to read into some of these questions and there's obviously the general context of Genesis but I want to just zero in on why he asks these questions or why I think he asks these questions and I think the first thing is that they're lost and they're isolated they're hiding you know they're hiding from each other they were once in unity, they were once together, now they're hiding. And so God's like, where are you? Why are you not together anymore? Why have you, why have you isolated? Why have you separated? Who told you that you were naked? Who has, who has interrupted this beautiful thing that, that was created? Who has stepped in and now challenged what was once a truth that you carried, which was that you were free and you were, you were safe? And then he asks them a genuine question. Have you eaten from the tree that I commanded you not to eat? Have you messed up? Like, because we all mess up. And God's like, hey, did you do it? And so that there's shame and then there's disobedience. There's sin. There's, there's the issue of man making a mistake. And then, what is this you have done? And I think for me, I just hear God's heart in this of like, what did you do? You know, we had this thing going and you just, you just stepped in now you know, and you've eaten this and you've interrupted this. And there's hurt, there's consequence, there's regret. This is the reality of human brokenness that's taken place. There was once this beautiful harmony and now brokenness has entered in. And how do we now react to this reality of brokenness that we all have, that humanity has? And there are three ways that I believe we can react to human brokenness. The first way is like what this character does in the, in the movie. He judges himself. He gives himself a bunch of expectations. He's like, I've got to meet all of these criteria. I've got to do it a certain way, do a certain time frame, because there's all this expectation. There's these things I have to accomplish. So that is what he's aiming to do, and he's pushing himself to do that. But he can't meet it. I can't meet that. I can't meet those expectations. 
I can't be perfect. I can't save the world. So that doesn't work. Secondly, I can be like, stuff it. I mean, <laughs> I'll just do my own thing. I don't care what you guys think. I'm just going to do whatever. I'm just going to whatever, you know? And that doesn't help either because now I'm just staying in my brokenness. I'm just wallowing in my own brokenness and it's just damaging me and destroying my life. But I'm just like, ah, whatever, you know? And I think we jump between those two realities as well. We go from a place of, oh, okay, got to do this, got to do this. And then, pff, didn't succeed. Okay, well, then I'll just give in completely to this. And then, oh, I'll go back to this again and uh, I've got to fix this brokenness now. And we go back and forth. But God responds in a third way. And this is, this is a quote from, a, from a, a song that I really, it's really powerful to me. And it says, You love me as you find me, but your love's too good to leave me here. He accepts us. He takes us in with our brokenness, but he's far too powerful He's far too loving. He's far too good to leave us in that brokenness. To, n- to, to almost like do us an injustice because he knows there's so much more we could have. And he's like, no, we are going this way. You know, I'm taking you with me. And I think that's the, that's the kind of response we have to have. That we take the reality of where we are. We don't hide from it. We say, cool, I've got issues. I've got brokenness. I've got all this stuff. But we realize that there is a unfair advantage. There's a power that's with us that can then shoot us forward into wherever we're going to go. So to go back to the garden, the enemy has got two main goals that he wants to accomplish. To separate us from God and separate us from each other. Now I've always remembered the separating from God thing but I started realizing that Sin not only interrupted our relationship with God, but interrupted the relationship between Adam and Eve, interrupted the relationship between us as humans. Sin gave way for war and conflict and all these things. And God's grace gives us the ability to forgive, to reconcile, to restore, to rebuild what was broken. And as long as we isolate from each other, we're missing out on the kingdom. We just, we are. As long as we're not connecting and building together, we are missing out on Eden. We're missing out on what heaven is for, what what God's ultimate purpose and plan is. There's a scripture, Matthew 5, verse 14, if we could all go go there with together. And they'll have it at the back as well, hopefully. Matthew 5, verse 14. All right. It says, You are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hidden. Nor do they light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a lampstand, and it gives light to all who are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. So a light doesn't work it's isolated. It's covered up, it's hidden, if it's ashamed, it's lost. A light works when it is put out, when it is seen, when everyone is able to look at it and, and, and admire it. Where it says, um, they don't light a lampstand, put it under a basket, but they put it on a lampstand and it gives light to everything. So we don't take a light and put it away and hide it. We take a light and put it on and we show it. And that's scary. That is scary to show ourselves and go, this is me, you know? But we have to because we're missing out, you know? You, you, I miss out when I hide. Yeah. And I, I, oh, I don't know, hey, I'm just going to... No, <laughs> we're missing out. Step out, speak, interact with each other, connect. Don't hide, no matter what you've got. No matter what you're going through, no matter what you're facing, don't hide. Talk to someone. Get out of that space. Mm. 
There's a, another song that's really impactful for me over the years um, from Switchfoot. And it says, Is this the world you want? You're making it. Our thoughts, the way we think, defines that context. The voices we listen to defines our world. Is this the world you want? You're making it every day that you're alive. And even if you don't like that fact, it's true. You are building your world every day that you're alive. And it's up to you how you build that world. Are you going to build it by yourself? Are you going to build it without God, without people? Or are you going to build it in unity and community? Are you going to build it with people that you trust? Are you going to build it in in a community of people? Because I think that that is part of God's response to our brokenness. Is that firstly He accepts us and He provides a way out. But then He says, I've got some people I'd like you to meet. I've got people that know stuff that can help you. I have people that can pray for you. I have people that can walk with you. They can hang out with you. And God's secret weapon is community. (laughs) His secret weapon is community. You love me as you find me, but your love is too good to leave me. So to leave me alone, to leave me abandoned, I'm going to put you in a community. And a community can be different things. can be family, can be friends, can be counsel, wisdom, advice. Going back to what you give your attention to, am I giving attention to this community? Am I engaging with my family? Those in my household? Am I giving them attention? Am I giving them focus? Am I allowing that part of my life to flourish and to build? Am I spending time with good friends? Am I prioritizing good conversations, good connections that encourage me, that build me up, that I get to encourage them and build them up? Yeah. Am I reaching out for advice? Or am I just too prideful and I think I can do it myself? <laughs> or am I reaching out for advice? There's someone in this room that knows more about money than you do. There's there's someone here. There's someone here that knows more about the Bible than you do. There's someone in this room that knows more about finding a job than you do. There's someone in this room that knows more about building, about creating a business, about investing, about any of these things. There are people in this room, a wealth of knowledge sitting next to you. You don't have to go far. You don't have to go looking for it. There are people in this room right now you can talk to. <laughs> like you can just be like, hey, can I chat to you about that? You've got some experience in this area. Can we connect? Can we have coffee? Literally right here. And so I think the main, main goal, or just what I want to say tonight, is that we have to, we have to reach out. We've got to break isolation. We've got to not only connect with God and be real with God and build with Him, but we've got to build with each other. We have to. This is not a cool suggestion. This is a necessity. Okay. We have to. Okay. So make time to see people. Make time to talk to them. Reach out. If you're facing stuff and you act like you're happy and you're fine and everything's good and you're on top of the world, but if you've got questions, speak, ask, reach out. It doesn't matter how old you are, how wise you are, what you're going through, all of us can get some counsel. All of us can get some help. All of us can get a friend to step in and encourage us or a family member to remind us of of the past and things we've experienced, or, or a wise individual who can come and share his own experience or her own experience of the past. This applies to all of us. Reach out. Cool. <laughs> that was <laughs> everything I wanted to say. Thank <laughs> you.
<laughs> so uh, you did well. <laughs> so um, when you're talking about having wives friends, was was I one of those? <laughs> Father, tonight I thank you for this powerful word. And I pray, Lord, that we would stop believing the lies of the enemy, the voices in our heads. And we believe your word over our lives. We'd say yes to you and we'd say yes to community. We'd be faithful to you and faithful to one another. We'd serve you and serve one another. I pray this, Father, in Jesus' mighty name. And everybody said, Amen.